Okay, good afternoon, everybody. This is the Tuesday, March 19th meeting of the Transportation and Parking Commission. My name is Donna Lascalia. I'm the chair of the commission and also the director of the Department of Public Works. Um, Seth, if you are ready, please call the roll and this meeting is being audio and video recorded. DPW Director Donna Lascalia. Here. Police Chief John Cartledge. Here. Planning and Sustainability Director Carolyn Mish. Here. Parking Enforcement Administrator Nancy Forrestal. Here. Counselor Alex Jarrett. Here. Counselor Deborah Pastrick Clemmer. Here. Adam is gone. Uh, Devin Bruce. Here. Diana Day Foskett is not here yet, right? Not here. Um, Jamie Albro Fisher. Yeah. That's it. Okay, we have a quorum. Thank you, Beth. All right, next I'll ask if there's anyone here for public comment. Um, it's your opportunity to address the commission on any matter. It, I ask if you are here for an agenda item that you hold your comments until we get to that item on the agenda. It just makes for a more orderly meeting. Um, but if there is anyone here who like to address the commission on a matter that is not on the agenda, please raise your hand and we will recognize you. Anyone here for our public comment? Okay, seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to approval of the minutes from the previous meeting, which was January 16th of 2024. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, so Nancy made the motion and I didn't catch who the second was. I was one of the two. Okay, Councillor, it's yours. Councillor Jarrett is the second. Is there any discussion on the minutes from January 16th? Okay, hearing none, Beth, please call the roll. Donna? Yes. John? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Alex? Yes. Deborah? Yes. yes. Um, Devin? Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry, yeah. confusion again. That happened last time. Um, and Jamie? Yes. That's... Uh, Passed with eight yeses. Okay, thank you, Beth. Next up is reports from departments. So I have a few updates from DPW. Um, the Mill and Overlay Project, which is our annual paving project, we expect to bid that in early April and we expect a contractor mobilization um, pretty quickly. So we'd like to get our paving done sooner rather than later this year. Um, so we've talked about this before, but I'll just repeat it. Um, we're going to be repaving the uh, Look Park roundabout and all the approaches. Uh, a lot of that is state layout, so we'll just be um, working within the city-owned portion of that roadway, but it is all the approaches to the Look Park roundabout. Um, we'll be doing Spring Street from Meadow Street to Colonel Valley Lane, a small portion of Loudville Road um, through Route 66 to the city limits. North Elm Street from Bridge Road to Locust Street, North Maple Street from Bridge Road to High Street, Chestnut Street from Bridge Road to High Street, Burt's Pit Road uh, from Clemens Street. Uh, we're going to be running about uh, 2,000 feet east of Clemens Street and Dana Street uh, off of Locust Street, small dead end road uh, up by uh, Smith Vogue. Um, we're also going to be reconstructing quite a few sidewalks on all of those streets as we've discussed um, at this commission. Um, and we're going to be doing the sidewalk uh, from Look Park Roundabout into uh, Florence Center. Um, then I'll move on to the I-91 bridge project, which is ongoing. Um, there are daytime lane closures on uh, Route 91, and any questions on that should be directed to MassDOT District 2. Um, and I'll also mention that Smith College has uh, generously agreed to um, fund uh, implementation of uh, traffic calming measures uh, on West Street um, and in the Route 9 corridor around the Smith College campus. Um, we are working with Fuss and O'Neill to design 
those improvements uh, and expect to be bidding those uh, for work over the summer and implementation um, before uh, the incoming uh, students come back to school in September. So kind of a tight, narrow window on that. Um, but we're looking at the installation of um, uh, rapid rectangular flashing beacons and kind of tightening up uh, some of the intersections that we've talked about um, at this commission uh, over the past several months and at city council as well. Um, so looking forward to the implementation of that project. So that's DPW updates. I don't know if Carolyn has anything for us. Um, yes. Oh, um, Councillor Jared has his hand up, but maybe a question for you, Donna. All right. Okay. Councillor Jared, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is all is the rail trail from State Street to Bridge Road also in the paving? I didn't it, hear. It is. It okay. is. Yes. It's it's not going to be part of the main paving project that we bid. It is a separate bid. Um, because we have a uh, drainage project at Adair Place that has to happen before um, we can pave the rail trail. Um, otherwise, those two projects will be in conflict with each other. So that's a separate bid. And we're also waiting for a potential grant announcement, which does not come through until July 1st. Um, so separate contract, but still anticipated to be done this construction season. Sorry, I didn't realize. Thank you. Was up. Okay, Carolyn, go ahead. Um, so just couple things. One is everyone may know that um, this is the time of year that the um, Bay State Bike Month um, planning starts to get into full swing. So that's in May. There'll be various um, events um, that are, will be filled out in the um, in various calendars, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, hosts a calendar, Mass Bike. Um, so be on the lookout for um, for those events to pop up for the month of May and um, North Han and the bike week for um, this region, I think is the second week of May um, out of that whole month. So that's one announcement. And then the other is that we are um, very close, the city of Northampton Again, we'll be the lead community for um, the regional bike share. Um, we have been meeting and reviewing requests for proposals to, for operators to restart bike share. Um, we have selected an operator and we're in the process of contract negotiations for that um, entity. And so we're hopeful that we can get the bikes back out. Um, later this spring, May-ish time frame. That's all I have. Okay, thanks, Carolyn. Anyone else have any updates for the commission? Okay, seeing and hearing none, we'll get into the um, matters before the commission. First up is a discussion of a traffic calming request for Henshaw Avenue. So um, for the for the counselors who um, have just joined this commission um, in January, we have a tremendous backlog of traffic calming applications that we are working through. So every month um, we try to select uh, three or four of them, put them on the agenda and move through them. Um, we don't bring a traffic calming request to this commission until we've had an opportunity to do some level of data collection and engineering analysis so that we can have um, kind of a more informed discussion around what, what actually is happening um, on the street. But we use this opportunity to hear from residents about what their experience might be. And we notify uh, the ward counselor and we also notify the, the person who submitted the traffic calming request that it's going to be on the agenda um, and then we just kind of open it up for comments so that we can hear, you know, maybe things that were not actually captured in the traffic calming request or maybe things have changed, you know, since we've had an opportunity to collect data. So um, in the interest of full disclosure, I think it's important that I note that we do have a tremendous backlog of these requests. And some of them are a couple of years old and we're just trying to sort of move them through our process. Um, as quickly as we can, but um, where where we have a request from every ward from many streets, um, you know, and and we're sort of limited in our capacity. 
Um, so with that being said, um, Henshaw Avenue, so this was submitted to us in October of 2022. Um, and it, the concern is that Henshaw Avenue is very narrow on weekdays when vehicles are parked. It's difficult at times for ongoing traffic to drive safely on the narrow avenue. So not dissimilar to um, a conversation that we recently had at this commission about um, Vernon Street and certainly plenty of other um, streets in a closer to downtown or closer to Smith College, which might be narrow. Um, so my comments on Henshaw Avenue are that it is, um, we need, when we mathematically calculate what it takes to kind of safely move people and vehicles down a street, um, we look at an 11 foot travel lane. Um, so ideally you have two 11 foot travel lanes just to give cars and trucks sort of comfort in passing each other. And then you have some level of shoulder um, for parking um, and you know, a parked car takes about eight feet of space. Um, so the statistics for Henshaw Avenue is that it's 1,430 feet long and it's 22 feet wide. So um, mathematically, we can sort of already see that, that it is a narrow road. Um, there are sidewalks on the east side for the entire length. Um, there are certain parking prohibitions in place. Um, and parking has actually been discussed at this commission um, back in 2017 where we actually changed the ordinance to swap parking from one side of the street to the other um, it, due to resident requests um, for kind of for exactly this problem. Um, and we thought that by, you know, moving the parking, um, we might offer some level of relief. Um, but it seems that this request is, is back to us. Um, so I would ask if the chief has any comments on um, uh, collision data uh, or any other anything else that he wants to add. Thanks, Donna. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, the collision, the five-year collision analysis um, revealed two collisions, uh, one in 2021 and one in 2022. One collision um, was involving a delivery truck that backed into a parked car. And the second collision, a vehicle crossed over the center line into the other lane, striking a vehicle that was traveling in the opposite direction. Um, this this accident did involve snow on the roadway, and most likely the operator was not traveling at a high rate of speed. Um, also, in this request, there was no speed data collected due to the complaint was more concerning about the narrow roadway. Thanks, Chief. You're um, so what I would say to the commission is that this is, again, not dissimilar to um, a lot of complaints that we get, um, particularly in this area, the areas around Smith, uh, downtown areas where, you know, you're trying to balance the tension of two-way traffic and not restricting parking. So at the time when we made some limited alterations to the parking on this street, um, th there was concerns uh, in city council about, you know, removing parking um, because that's that's obviously a, a tremendous burden for for some. Um, so, you know, this um, <laughs> this request is sort of representative of the tension that we face in trying to maintain emergency vehicle access. You know, comfortable traffic flow where you don't have people clipping mirrors um, and the ability of people to safely get in and out of their driveways. Um, I think the two accidents sound like something that would not surprise me on a street that's this narrow. So um, I want to ask if there's um, anyone from the public who's here to speak to us about Henshaw Avenue. Okay, I don't see anyone. Any comments from any members of the commission? on this as we review what our options might be. Councilor Jarrett. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, so, you know, the director and I have, have discussed various places in the city uh, with issues similar to this. And I've kind of come to, as a counselor, I've come to a, a process of how I think about um, whether to change parking. Uh, and first is, are there police, fire, or EMS concerns? Um, and then second, if there's a courtesy one-way traffic flow, which I imagine there certainly is here, um, are there breaks where one vehicle can pull over to let another pass? You know, a driveway um, <clears throat> often facilitates this, but I, I'm not sure it looked, I just looked at the street view and it, it kind of looked like they're on the side where they're now parking is allowed. There's not a lot of driveways. Um, so I wonder if, if there are areas like long stretches where it's hard to see if, you know, one person is coming in and then the other person comes in, they can't get by. They'd actually have to back out. Is that the case uh, or are there, um, <clears throat> so that, that would be an assessment to, to consider. Um, and then are the, are there ordinance violations, you know, three feet to driveways, 20 feet to intersections, or is the way restricted to less than 12 feet? That would be an ordinance violation. Um, and we would want uh, in some level of enforcement uh, around that. So those are the things, you know, I, I think about um, in terms of, in terms of changing the parking ordinances. And I wonder if anyone's familiar enough with this area to speak to you know, do we have long stretches where it's continuous, continuously parked cars and it's, you know, two cars enter that without really realizing and then have to back out or perhaps cross when it's way too narrow to, to, for two to pass? Yeah, I think the, um, when you first turn off of Route 9, um, you have a, a section that's um, just about 600 feet. Uh, where you have a parking restriction on one side, but parking allowed on the other side. And I think that that is a tough area to move through. I mean, 600 feet is kind of a long threat. Um, and I do know that we have heard from at least one resident there who was sort of active in the 2017 timeframe, um, who is really struggling with movement in and out of her driveway because you know, there were initially sort of visibility concerns um, when cars were parked on the side of her driveway and now cars are parked directly behind her driveway, you know, which is sort of restricting turning movements in and out of the driveway. So uh, my comment on this is much like Vernon Street, your first, you know, several hundred feet off of Route 9 is a very challenging stretch and you sort of get two people nose to nose in there. And and my experience with that stretch is, is that it's tight. I, I don't know if anyone else has any comments on that. Yes, Councilor. Um, yeah, I would just uh, ask, you know, DPW to consider whether it would make sense to put brakes so that if there are continuous areas of parking that that we maybe establish a, a maximum distance where you you uh, want to you know you wouldn't you want to have a break at least every hundred feet let's say I'm not sure what the right number is um, <clears throat> and then to consider changes in the parking ordinance to to reflect that so that the courtesy one-way traffic can flow smoothly is there a sense of if we were to restrict parking here, because ultimately that's how you solve this problem is you restrict parking and you kind of open this up so people can move a little more freely. Is there a sense of how Smith may feel about that or how residents may feel about that? I don't know the demographic of that neighborhood, if it's heavily Smith or residential or some combination, or if there's renters or if everyone's got a driveway, or I'm just not sure the the makeup of that neighborhood. Um, but ultimately you'd be looking at the elimination of, you know, a not insignificant number of parking spaces to do what you're describing. Go ahead, Nancy. So this is a combination. Further down from Elm Street, you pick up more residential. Um, the first half of um, 
Henshaw is heavily um, student oriented. And we have found that this is a um, this is a high priority enforcement area for parking enforcement because of the potential for people to be parking too close to driveways and in prohibited parking zones. So it is something that is very much on parking enforcement's radar with um, multiple times a day um, checks in that area. Um, we have had fewer complaints once the parking was moved over to the opposite side of the road. Um, we've had far fewer complaints from residents about people parking like right on top of their driveway. So that, that has been a definite um, plus as far as that change. Um, but if we eliminate parking, we run the risk of just pushing these cars to the next street over, which of course is a hazard each time we, we do anything on one street, it will potentially impact the next neighborhood over. So I think that that's something to keep very much in mind um, for any potential changes on this street. Can I ask, um, Donna, it, it would the I is the idea just so there this it says seventeen to thirty seven is that the idea of where parking might be um, considered to be prohibited just in that section or in um, further down closer to Elm Street because I think what Nancy was referring to is there's on street parking on the west side lower down and it seems like that's not the issue down in that location but it really starts at number 17. Yeah I mean I, I think what's complicated in, in areas like this is when you don't have you know stripe defined parking spots um, you know people sort of move around and they can close in on driveways as Nancy said. Um, so if we were to come through here and let's say we created some scenario where it was like, okay, we're gonna gap this out and create a pullout as Councillor Jarrett described, how do you sign that in a way that people will comply without actually striping on the ground? So I hear your question and you know, not I don't want to necessarily have like a heavy-handed response to this and say, well, we're just going to remove parking because you're going to put up a sign up that you're going to put a sign up, and people may not necessarily respect that sign unless we actually paint the ground, which is a whole different maintenance um, and enforcement issue. Um, so you know, we would have to be very strategic about exactly where we're restricting parking to sort of make this cutout, and will people comply with it? And that's that's a tricky question yeah. to answer. And it looks like just to add to that, it looks like the first three, and maybe you already noted this in the presentation, the first three buildings beyond that dorm are Smith owned. So 17, 21, and whatever that next building is are Smith owned as opposed to, I mean, they might still have tenants, but they're Smith controlled. And then after that is where it's private you know, going up to the curve and Henshaw. So um, <clears throat> that may make a difference in terms of where it's more tightly controlled. Yeah, I think the, the traffic is probably a little more diffuse as you get into the neighborhood more, you know, because you're losing a lot of cars into the, you know, Smith yeah. facilities potentially. Yep. Deb, I see your hand up, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I'm looking at Google Maps, and it looks like across from number 33, there's a large parking lot. And, you know, I was just wondering if maybe um, there was a little more of a buffer to the entry of that parking lot, like maybe re removing a couple of spots, you know, one behind it, and then a couple in front, there'd be more of a opportunity for cars to pull in over there. Um, and then that would, you know, it's not that far from number 17. So I don't know if that is possible or you know, maybe eliminate three spots, two or three spots. Yeah, as Councillor Jarrett was discussing, I think I would want to engage Smith um, and, and just, you know, have a quick conversation with them about um, what impacts that may or may not have on their operation. Um, it's just more of a courtesy call than anything. 
Um, but, you know, like Nancy said too, we just want to be careful um, in playing a nuclear option, like, okay, no parking anywhere. Um, you know, that's, that's not going to be good. Right. Well, this um, would only be a couple of spots, maybe one in front and one behind the entrance to that parking, large parking area. Nancy, what's your thought on enforcement of that? I mean, if we just tried to pick off a, a couple of spots like that, do you feel like we could sign that in a way that would clearly communicate to folks what's permissible? Sure. Um, so long as we have highly visible signage, but we we don't need it to turn into what happened on Prospect, where Prospect has more prohibited parking um, up towards Elm Street, which just pushed everybody down Prospect. So then you have complaints from the residents further down that the cars will just leapfrog down that way. And that's, that's potentially what's going to happen here. Um, these cars are going to go somewhere. It's just we have to we have to be very aware that there are a lot of students in that area and there is very limited parking. So they will find someplace else to park. Um, and that's that potentially is going to create a problem on the next neighborhood over. So the larger question, and I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, but the larger question is, you, you know, we've had kind of a similar conversation about Vernon Street. This is clearly, you know, an area that um, gets parked up. Um, and, you know, we can certainly go street by street. But as Nancy said, we just have to be mindful that as we're moving street by street, we could be pushing traffic onto a different street that will then be before us. Um, go ahead, Councillor Jarrett. Um, yeah, I wasn't advocating for a particular solution necessarily, but but more a greater uh, assessment of of the situation. You know how how often. We're coming up with with kind of with a metric of some kind that says if you have continuous parking for you know this this distance that's too far for courtesy one way, and on Vernon Street um, there are an, in that particular block between Jewett and Route Nine there's there's a number of driveways that nat naturally give that break it up and give that space. Um, it's unclear to me. Uh, on Henshaw, I, I think I'd want to do a site visit to to try to understand that better. Um, but so that that was that was my general suggestion. I don't have a strong opinion about what should be done here because I don't feel like I have enough information. Yep. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, and I think you know every street really does have a different personality. I think there's a little more elbow room on Vernon than there is on this street, just based on, on Henshaw, just based on my experience driving through there. Um, so, you know, here I would feel like we may need to be uh, a little more restrictive in parking to kind of open this up. Um, then we would need to be on Vernon just because there's a little more space um, with driveways. But as Councillor Pastor Plummer noted, you know, there is that parking lot. So, you know, maybe we could have a little flexibility in there to give people spaces to, to pull off. But, um, you know, either way, I, I, I think we can certainly reassess and have a discussion with uh, police and fire about what they may need to see for their vehicles. Um, and we will likely return to the commission with some recommendation for some level of, of parking restriction after sort of polling the audience. I, I think the question for Councilor Pastor Clummer is um, what appetite the neighborhood may um, have for that um, and, and how that may impact the, the folks who actually live a, a little bit further up the road. That, that's, the, um, that's the question. I think if I can just make one last point, um, we also want to make sure that when we remove parking off of the street, it it also impacts the residents and their guests, um, or if it's uh, 
multi-family and there isn't enough parking in a driveway, they need to find some place to park too. So this could impact also the residents in that area. And we wanna be aware of that. Thank you, Nancy. So we'll take a little closer look at this um, and uh, possibly be back here um, with some parking restrictions if it makes sense um, after we've thoroughly vetted that. Anyone else have any further comments or suggestions for us as we um, take this and add it to the traffic common queue? Okay. All right, thank you for the discussion on that. Next up is a discussion of the traffic calming request for North Main Street. Um, so this also came to us in uh, October of 2022. Um, and it, there is a crosswalk um, at Greeley Avenue, um, which is a small dead end road uh, located off Route 9 by uh, up by the Wolf Park Roundabout. Um, and there is a crosswalk there and a uh, resident uh, notified us that their children use the crosswalk um, and uh, that uh, oftentimes um, cars aren't stopping. I'm sort of paraphrasing uh, what's on the screen quite badly, um, but oftentimes cars don't stop um, or they don't see signage. Um, and uh, so their children feel unsafe in the crosswalk. Um, so what they're asking for is uh, a flashing light or a speed hump. Um, so I just have a couple of comments on this um, that it, this is kind of tricky in that it's at the approach to, or it's very close to the approach to the Lick Park roundabout. Um, so when we reviewed this, we did not, feel like um, that speed was a significant factor here. This is primarily a traffic volume, um, traffic flow, and advanced warning signage issue. Um, Chief, can you just comment on any collision data in the area? Sure. Um, so we conducted a five-year collision analysis. Um, it was the section of North Main from Bardwell to Hayward um, up towards the roundabout. During the five years, three collisions occurred and all occurred at the intersection with Bardwell. In 2018, a car was rear-ended while waiting for a pedestrian to cross the street. Also in 2018, a vehicle pulling off of Bardwell pulled in front of a car on North Main Street. And finally, in 2019, a vehicle waiting to turn on to Bardwell was rear-ended. Um, it was notable that all three occurred at this intersection with Bardwell. And that's that's all the data that we had for that. Okay, thanks, Chief. You're welcome. Um, so we did an assessment of kind of the signage that we have in the area. We just have standard um, pedestrian crossing signs, no advanced signage, um, no flashings or RRFBs, um, rapid rectangular flashing beacons that you see in various places around town. Those are not present uh, at this um, crossing. So just uh, standard crosswalk signs. I will note that um, over the years, we receive uh, many requests for uh, speed humps on pretty much every road in the city. Um, this is a major arterial roadway, it's Route 9. Um, we would not install any sort of vertical speed deflection on this street. Um, the noise would be absolutely unbearable and the traffic volume is not, um, it's just not an acceptable installation on, on a road such as Route 9, um, and it, it would not be reasonable uh, for the quality of life for anyone um, in, a, in any sort of radius around it, given the, the heavy uh, truck traffic. So those are uh, engineering um, and general comments um, on this area. I don't know if anyone has any comments for us, um, or if there's anyone here from the public who wishes to talk to us about uh, this particular pedestrian crossing. I don't see anyone from the public. Anyone, Councillor Jarek, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I am, you know, 
I think about Bridge Road at Mountain Street and Hillcrest Drive, where a couple of years ago there was a flashing, uh, you know, button activated um, <clears throat> beacon. And I'm curious about, are there particular metrics or, you know, obviously maybe traffic, the amount of traffic flow. I imagine this road has a lot of traffic flow, as does Bridge Road. Uh, but are there particular metrics where we would say, yes, it is appropriate to have a, a beacon? Yeah, a metric would be um, average daily volume of cars and also pedestrian crossings. Um, so we would take like pedestrian counts. So one of the reasons um, or the primary reason um, that we installed an RFB on Bridge Road um, was because of the field. Um, so you've got sort of heavy um, pedestrian volume there combined with the heavy traffic flow and those two factors put together um, would say to us, this is a place to install these RFBs um, with the um, cost of installation and the cost of maintenance um, you're correct. We do have to have some level of metric of of where would we put these. We would love to have them, you know, at every crosswalk in the entire city, and that's um, obviously not uh, financially or operationally viable. Um, when we look at this crossing, it's a more low volume crossing uh, for pedestrians um, versus a place like that's next to a recreational facility. Um, what you're picking up here is um, pedestrians from this dead end street um, because there's no, you know, there's not even a sidewalk um, uh, on the other side. So you're, you're just sort of picking up traffic from uh, this side street. So you just don't have the pedestrian count that you'd have in a, in a place like that. Mm -hmm. And a step down from that, uh, also in Bridge Rose at the Lathrop community where there's a, a crosswalk and I, 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 was this the Lathrop folks that put the flags, the basket of flags on either side? Does the city support anything like that, or is that something that the city would allow? If yes, we actually have yeah, we have a policy around that, um, and we allow any um, private resident, or sometimes we get groups like the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts, and they want to make an installation. So we actually have a link on our website um, where you can fill out an application and let us know, you know, where you want to put those flags in. Um, and, you know, we give you sort of specifications about, okay, put it here, mount it this high, um, and, you know, you agree to maintain it. So, yes, we do have a program that where that's allowable. Is that something we might recommend for this, this particular location? Absolutely. Anything to increase visibility, sure. Go ahead, Diana. Um, I had a question, I, and I suspect that the answer is we can't do anything, but as far as the residents' concern in the complaint about people trying to go around when people are stopped in the crosswalk, is there anything that the city has any tool in its toolbox for, you know, any kind of narrowing or putting in a curb or, or kind of pulling in at the crosswalk to stop that from happening? And I know that happens at, at probably a bunch of crosswalks that are similarly situated. And I just wanted to know, are there, are there options that we can do that would cut down on that? Yeah, there's, we have the ability to install bump outs. So what you see is like curb extensions um, where there's a crosswalk. So an example of that would be like in Florence Center at the Cumberland Farms, where we install curb extensions to give pedestrians less exposure um, as they're crossing and that keeps the vehicles sort of queued up in a single lane and you avoid this sort of, well, you're stopped and I'm going to pass you on the right or I'm going to pass you, um, you know, in places that I shouldn't be. Um, so that is um, certainly uh, a tool that we have uh, anytime we make that sort of alteration to a roadway, there's drainage considerations and utility considerations. Um, you know, like we, we try not to install, you know, curbing and extensions, um, you know, in ways that interrupt the flow of stormwater, um, and particularly in places where we have sort of known flooding issues, and this is one of those places. Um, so it, it probably wouldn't be a viable solution here. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on this particular location? Okay. 
All right, thanks for that discussion. Next up is a discussion of the traffic calming request for Landy Avenue. Um, so the resident's concern here is that Landy Avenue is um, being used as a cut through, cars traveling at high rate of speed. There are no sidewalks on this street. Um, this traffic calming request was uh, submitted to us November 8th of 2022. And uh, Chief, would you mind um, giving us your comments on collisions and speed, please? Of course. Um, we did a five-year collision analysis and there was zero collisions for this location. We did place a speed data collection device in front of 46 Landy Ave from August 14th through August 28th, 2023. During the data collection period, the speed speeds of 2,128 vehicles were analyzed. The average speed was 19 miles an hour and the 85th percentile speed was 24.1 miles per hour. Okay, thanks, Chief. Um, that yeah. averages out to um, about 150 cars a day um, over that 14-day period. Um, Landy Avenue is approximately 800 feet long, um, and it is 22 feet wide, which does make it on the narrow side. As I mentioned, um, there are no sidewalks present, um, and notably, there's also no speed regulation. Um, posted. So there is no posted speed limit on Landy Avenue. Um, so for those who sort of been following the implementation of the 25 mile an hour um, speed limit, um, uh, statutory speed limit uh, within the city limits uh, in the event that this street were to be considered thickly settled, um, which it likely is, the speed limit here would be uh, 25 miles an hour. So um, there are overall assessment of this area is no collision speed does not appear to be a factor. Um, and, you know, oftentimes the speed that we measure is a little bit different than um, what residents may be uh, experiencing. Um, and that appears to be the case here. Um, does, uh, is there anyone from the public who's here from Landy Avenue who wishes to speak to us? I see Celeste, we're gonna unmute you if you could, um, just say your name and your city of town or residence and um, go ahead. Hi there, my name is Celeste Palladino. I'm at 29 Landy Ave in Florence. Um, I guess my only thought would be, you know, that was that was great to hear some of the traffic data. I would be curious to know if that data was taken kind of um, when Maine's field was open or during a season when there are games and everything. Um, I know at some point in the future, there will probably be more dwellings built on Landy Ave. And I guess what I would say is I would just hope that whenever the road was repaved, that sidewalks would be considered. Um, I know that, you know, I have two kids and kind of letting them walk over to Mainsfield or alternately in the other direction. Um, on Nonatuck, cars coming around the Florence Medical Building um, they come around that curve really, really quickly. So while the overall data, I mean, uh, speed may be low, the the few cars that that speed through do really seem to be going um, quite quickly. And I guess just the lack of sidewalks is concerning. Thanks. Okay, thank you for your comments. So the data was collected August 14th through the 28th of, of uh, 2023. Um, so I'm not... Um, super familiar with the schedule for Mainsfield, um, but I would imagine there's some level of recreational activity there um, at that time. I don't, we could certainly uh, check in with the park and rec director and, and see what the programming is um, at, at that time of year, but your, your comment on that is duly noted and we wanna make sure we're actually capturing um, actual conditions. So thank you for that comment. Any comments, Councillor Jared? Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, this this is in Ward Five. Um, I, my question, I guess, for the Chief is, uh, you know, what what that eighty fifth percentile speed means is that one in seven are traveling faster than that twenty four point one miles per hour, and I'm curious if you have a sense of the outliers uh, in your data. You know, are there? <clears throat> Are there is that of that one in seven? Is it just 
27, 28, or or there are there folks as as Celeste referred to, where there's 40 miles an hour, et cetera. Thanks, Counselor. I, I don't have the specific data in front of me. I just have this response form. So I could certainly get back to the commission with that at some point. Great. Thanks. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the, just thinking about the narrowness, I mean, I think, you know, ideally we would have sidewalks on, on all streets uh, in this, in this area, but there's, and I do hope that if when Landy Ave comes around that we consider that, but there's also the, the question of how wide our streets should be. I'm not, how wide was, is Landy Ave? 22 feet. 22. So not, not that wide. Um, yeah, just thinking that, that do we ever consider actually narrowing our streets when we redo them, both from a, a perspective of, you know, being able to add street trees, um, add sidewalks and uh, provide um, traffic calming, um, but also that that's less pavement that we have to plow. And then eventually, you know, in the long term, that that saves us money. I, I mean, I, I think more of streets like certain parts of Blackberry Lane or Hillcrest Drive or very wide streets where there's just not a lot of traffic. Um, <clears throat> but uh, just putting that out there. Yeah, I agree. And and also from a drainage perspective, too, you know, the more impervious surface, the more stormwater we need to manage and and you know, collect and send somewhere where it's not disruptive um, to, you know, residents and to our system. Um, you know, where it's 22 feet wide, if you were to sort of leave conditions as they are currently and say, okay, we, we'd like to try to get a sidewalk in here. Um, I don't know specifically what the right of way is, or, you know, the right of way can vary from property to property, the city's right of way. Um, and it, I, I'm familiar with Landy Ave, it's relatively flat. There are some drainage problems there and there is not actually formal drainage on a portion of that street. Um, and so, you know, you'd have to get at least five feet in there for a sidewalk um, and then some to just have a little buffer between the road and the sidewalk, um, which could definitely start to push into residents' property in a way that is not, um, uh, desirable or, or not ideal, I think would be a better word. Um, so I, I hear your comment about narrowing the road and it's certainly something we could consider. I mean, we measured 150 cars a day um, through there in a two week stretch, which is not a huge amount of traffic. So, you know, could we consider sort of shrinking that down and it becomes some level of courtesy one way traffic? Um, that's an that's a interesting plan. Um, or an interesting thought um, to, to think about as we plan. So, um, Carolyn, go ahead. Um, so I was noticing and, and sort of wondering as this conversation was progressing um, that there may be other issues that um, contribute to at least the initial speed. And the, it appears that the intersection of Landy and Riverside is much wider than 22 feet and maybe as much as 45 feet. And the, may, the same thing may be the case on the other end um, at Nonatuck, I'm not sure, but if the, um, the, in the subdivision regs for new streets, we look at creating a very narrow entry at a street intersection and then widening out to 22 or 24 feet. And I wonder if a similar treatment might have, at some point be looked at as an appropriate way to slow traffic coming in so people aren't um, accelerating into the street as they come off of the major roads on either side. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's, I mean, I talked a little bit at the beginning of the meeting about, um, you know, the work that Smith College is funding um, on West Street. And one of the things that we're going to do is paint um, corners of intersections to just sort of tighten those turning radiuses up. So I I hear that. And um, as we look at Riverside Drive, which is a um, a good candidate for uh, resurfacing, um, that's absolutely something that we would consider to try to tighten up that intersection, at least on that end, um, if we were to move through there with any sort of reconstruction. Brett, I see your hand up. We'll unmute you. Just need your name and city or town, please. Uh, 
Hi, thanks. Good afternoon, Brett Constantine, Bike Ped Subcommittee, Northampton. I just wanted to echo what Carolyn just pointed out, which is that it is very wide on the Riverside end of things. Um, I have driven that faster than I would like to admit. And I take that because it's easier. So it is the easier path rather than going around the twisty bend at the end of Riverside. So I would love to see drivers like me not be able to do that. I also support sidewalks. Thanks. Thank you, Brett. Go ahead, Councillor Jarrett. Yeah, just one last thing. I believe that Mainsfield, uh, the, the dates were after the flooding that occurred last summer. So there wouldn't have been, but Mainsfield was closed at that time. Is that correct? Yeah, we had, um, I'm trying to remember when the flooding would have been like the first week in August. That's a good point. Might be worth a recollect um, because of that extenuating circumstance. I believe that flooding was the first week in August, but I, or it was the end of July, maybe. So that's a good point. Thank you, Councilor. Any other comments on Landy Avenue? All right, so for Celeste and, and Brett and uh, the other commissioners, um, we will, uh, we may um, look at this. I want to talk to the Parks and Rec Director and just determine exactly what, if any, programming may have still been happening there. I know that they relocated um, baseball and softball, um, but it's unclear to me what other programming may have been happening there. Like, you know, there's volleyball and other facilities there um, that that may have been in, in service. So I, I just want to kind of get a sense of what exactly was happening um, in this time frame last year. And then we'll communicate out um, how that goes. Any other comments? Okay, next up is a proposed ordinance relative to parking areas reserved for municipal use. Um, so this is kind of a lengthy ordinance. I'm not gonna read it, um, but I am gonna hand this off to Nancy to uh, talk to us um, uh, about the uh, modification here. So go ahead, Nancy. So um, in the parking garage, the EJ Gare parking garage, they there are two spaces that have been dedicated to the EV charging stations for both of the uh, parking enforcement vehicles, which are both EV. Um, and what we need is to have that restricted to parking enforcement vehicles only in those in those two spaces. This will be the first level, first two spaces on the right in the parking garage. That would be the north side. Thank you for the screen share on that. So may I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? Devin, so moved. Okay, is I'll there second. a second? Thank you, Jamie. Okay, any further discussion on this? Comments, questions? So it's noted in uh, red uh, on the ordinance on the screen. So I have a question. Go ahead, Carolyn. Um, so these are currently allocated for uh, other private, so the, for the public to come and park EV cars? No, and these, we... these are both um, uh, city um, charging stations. They've been there um, for, they were put in for the parking enforcement vehicles uh -huh. several years ago. So they are not um, the charge point stations. They're, they're not the public parking. The, uh -huh. Directly across from those are where the public charging stations are. That's what I thought. So this is just making the ordinance match what's happening in reality. Correct. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other comments, questions on this? 
I have a motion on the floor for a positive recommendation. So hearing nothing else, uh, Beth, if you could, please call the roll. Donna? Yes. John? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Alex? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Debin? Yes. Diana? Yes. And Jamie? Yes. That passes with nine yeses. Okay, thank you, Beth. Next up is the annual traffic safety report from Chief Cartledge. Chief, the floor is yours. Thanks, Donna. I'm just going to run through the highlights of this, and then if anyone has any questions at the end, I can certainly answer those. So this is the annual traffic safety report that I have to produce for the commission each year. Um, let's see, 2023, our officers issued 3,424 citations. 2,532 were warnings, 458 were civil fines, 255 were criminal complaints, and 179 were uh, someone who was actually arrested for a criminal charge. Um, page two, operating under the influence, OUI. We had 86 arrests for OUI alcohol. We had 17 arrests for OUI drugs. We had 24 subsequent offenses and 30 of the arrests for the year were residents of Northampton. Um, 103 people were charged with operating under the influence of alcohol or drugs. This was a 25.6% increase from 2022. Um, most operators, 70.9% who were charged with OUI were not residents of Northampton. Uh, moving on to collisions. In 2023, our officers investigated 564 motor vehicle accidents. Of those collisions, 483 involved personal injury or property damage over 1,000, which results in mandatory completion of a state accident form. We had 95 that included injury, 446 that were just property damage, and 14 had um, an injury with a pedestrian related to them. Uh, let's see. We also, if you go on to the next page, under the grants, we applied for and received grant funding for $6,237.50 for the purchase of 55 child passenger safety seats. We also applied for and received grant funding, uh, $34,983 for targeted enforcement waves and equipment. And then right below, you can see the, the different campaign focuses throughout the year and how many car stops we completed for the grant. Um, the grant funding was also used to purchase a covert speed measuring device to assist with the collection of the speed data that we use in this commission. Uh, we also applied for this fiscal year and received grant funding for $39,195.75 for the same sort of uh, in targeted enforcement. And we're still collecting the data for, for that, which I will report next year. And then this grant was also used to purchase LIDAR, radar, and portable breath tests for our agency. Um, in October 2021, we implemented a directed traffic enforcement program. Covert data speed is used to identify roadways where people are operating over the posted speed limit. Um, also, residents can call and request us to direct uh, have direct traffic enforcement on their street or any streets where they feel that speeding may be a problem. And then just some of the recommendations. We are gonna reapply for the Massachusetts Road Safety Program and FY25. 
um, and also apply for grant funding for bicycle safety, child passenger restraint systems, or any type of bike safety. Uh, uh, continue to review motor vehicle collisions and identify any areas of concern and continue our strong focus of OUI enforcement on the, especially on the overnight shift um, and continue to support the efforts of this commission with any other concerns that might be brought forward. It's kind of an overview. I don't know if anyone has any specific questions I could answer for them. Thanks, Chief. You're welcome. Go ahead, Councillor Jarrett. Uh, thanks. Um, so my question is is more general uh, because it's, you know, I think we in the city take an approach that uh, an evidence-based data-driven approach to traffic safety is, is, uh, is our method of, of um, and I'm curious from that perspective, you know, I, I know that the chief looks at that from an enforcement perspective, there's also the engineering perspective DPW would consider. Um, then there's education, the three E's. Um, and what what are the top interventions among all our, our of our options and what would give us the most uh a lack of bang for the buck, <laughs> I guess we would say. Um uh so th th I, that's what I think about, and I, I'm wondering if there's a uh, a holistic look uh, at at all of the options and and how how we're prioritizing. I think one of the main tools that is very helpful is the speed data collection because if someone calls and complains about uh, cars speeding, if we get a sense of what the actual speeds are and see that it, it is a high speeding area, then we can target our enforcements in that that area. Um, prior, prior to that, people would call and kind of request an officer be present at certain times of the day for, you know, speeding or other traffic concerns. And we would try to have an officer be there each day. Um, if it was someone passing a school bus or crosswalk violations or speeding, um, but with the speed data collection tool that gives us actual evidence of a, of a problem or not. Um, the other areas, officers try to sit in areas they feel might be a problem as well as, you know, getting complaints from the public. Um, but that's kind of where we're at with that. With the grant is very helpful because we do receive the funding to, you know, pay, pay the officers extra time to be out there. Yeah, Devin, thank you. Go ahead. Um, Chief Cartlidge, this is just a comment. I, I know we're really good at collecting incident data, like how many tickets or how many stops. And the thing that I've always wanted is better exposure data. You know, were there more cars on the road in 2023 than there were in 2021? So mm -hmm. it's, it's just a comment about the fact that that makes the incident data mean more than if it's just counting the bad things or the good things. It's the exposure number is what I could always hope for. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I, I guess I would add, um, I, I appreciate that, Chief. Uh, and and I, it's clear that from within the enforcement realm, you are making data-driven decisions. Um, what I what I'm thinking about is when you balance, you know, engineer the costs of engineering, the costs of enforcement, and ed educational, um, <clears throat> are we looking holistically and saying, well, you know, th this amount of money will, will improve our safety um, <clears throat> better if spent in X way. And I don't know which way it is, uh, but I'm curious maybe if, if the planning department uh, makes any assessments there or if, if other departments are thinking in that way. I definitely think it's a, it's a good way to look at things. Um, I'm just not sure what, you know, we'd have to kind of brainstorm with other departments to have a, an enforcement effort altogether, I guess, in that way. 
I mean, just to to build on that, I think um, this um, venue is sort of a good way to look at um, what are some of the physical improvements that could be made to then address some of these um, statistics in certain areas. So um, that then it would ultimately have, um, you know, a potential reduction in personnel dollars spent on, you know, enforcement or education. If And I think we've talked a lot, certainly in over the last couple of years about how signage and enforcement and education isn't as good at changing speeds as, you know, physical constraints or impediments in the in the road, so engineering and design and implementation. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to the engineering E. I mean, my, my comment on this is that what we find is that the way you slow drivers down is by putting something in the way. You, you put something in the way that they must stop for or that they must avoid, and that is, you know, it, it, if you're making a list or if you're ranking things, um, you know, that's how you're going to get speed reduction. Um, when we look at speed home, speed tables, you know, you get three to five miles an hour and speed reduction uh, off of that. And that can often mean the distance, mean the difference between, you know, a terrible outcome and a less horrible outcome. Um, so, you know, anytime we look at reconstruction of roadways, we're looking at, are there ways to shrink intersections? Are there ways to um, you know, can we put a speed hump in here? Does it make sense um, from a, a construction and sort of roadway geometry standpoint? So I, you know, my comment on this is that we should always be sort of looking at building our roads to have the outcome that we want, which is lower speeds and, and safer access for everybody but we obviously can't touch every road in the city. So now we have to move to other tools like can we enhance signage um, in a way that can communicate and educate drivers um, of what we're expecting from them. Um, so, it, you know, it's it's just difficult for us because there's, you know, uh, 160 miles of road and, and you'd like to touch all of it, but um, obviously that's not feasible. Thank you all. Any other comments um, or questions for the chief? Thank you for that report. Very much appreciated. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, move on. Is there any new business? Okay, hearing none, may I have a motion to adjourn, please? Move to adjourn. I second it. Okay, that's Carolyn and Councillor Patrick Clemmer. Any discussion? Okay, Beth, call the roll, please. We gotta unmute you, Beth. Thank you. Donna? Yes. John? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Alex? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Devin? Yes. Diana? Yes. Jamie? Yes. That passes with nine yeses. <laughs>